Um, Scott, why don't you start us off and just tell us like how this crazy collective came about? I mean, what started it all? What was the need? Well, um, I know at least for myself, um, you know, I, I graduated um, grad school in uh, 98 and, um, and, and moved back to Portland um, soon after. And uh, I started working um, at, the, at the, main, the main photo co-op, which um, Nat can speak about probably better than I can because he actually worked there. Um, but that was a similar space, um, you know, it had a, had a color processor and some uh, black and white dark rooms, um, not, not unlike what the collective is. And, and me and a bunch of other people obviously um, printed there. Um, and that, in, you know, Nat could probably speak to, I don't know exactly what happened there, but, but that place sort of um, went out of business essentially. Um, and ended up closing the doors. And so me and several other people, including uh, Nat and uh, Tanya Hollander, and I think that early group included people like um, Sean Harris and uh, a few other people like Joe Della Valley and Andy Cross and, and some others. And uh, we basically decided we needed a space because we were all color photographers that were hooked to, um, you know, these color processors that you can't really own on your own. It's one of those things that needs to be done, you know, with a sort of group effort, both in cost and sort of the physical space that it takes up. So uh, we decided to start our own collective. Um, and, 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 and we, and I got, I got to say props to Bill Gillis, who was, who, who basically uh, owned, owned, I guess, he didn't really run the, the photo co-op and he, he, uh, gave us all the equipment from that old space um, for a sum of money. He basically gave it to us with a contract that we would pay him over a certain period of time um, for the equipment. And we found that space in the Calderwood Bakery building that was super cheap. And we, you know, at, at that point, it was like 500 bucks a month to rent that space. And, you know, we decided if all we needed, it was like five people, hundred bucks each a month, and we could get going. And we, we built the space out um, and we all pitched in some money and got it going and then uh, realized we weren't gonna be able to get there. So we actually, as Nat said earlier, we, um, we had the first fun, first photo of GoGo -Go actually uh, that year, which was like either the end of 99, early 2000. Um, it was, that was probably actually the spring, middle of the spring 2000 we had the first uh, fundraiser and I, I should give a shout out to Betsy Evans Hunt who, who was had a gallery in that space in the Calderwood building. Um, you know, she's the one that handled the <clears throat> Todd Webb archive and, and uh, you know, we, we had the, the first fundraiser there and made enough money to finish out the space. Um, so was Essentially it the rest is history and you know we we gathered a lot of people like people sort of we we started out with a bunch of people and then we lost a bunch of people building out the space through you know various reasons and then as soon as we opened we ended up getting a whole bunch more members and it was a while before we actually started renting space to people but um you know initially it was really just a shared studio essentially you know where we all worked yeah Wait, I would have to say one thing. Is Jack here? He is. There he is. <laughs> Jack is here. All right, Jack missed the, uh, the check-in. Jack's in the house. Right, okay. So Jack, just we, I gave, I, I, I didn't include you in the intros. When, when were you, tell us your era. When were you involved? Oh, you're muted. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, hi Jack. Hey Jack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I started. I was at uh, Main Photo Co-op for a while, uh, and then because of work issues and other things going on, I punched out for a couple of years and avoided the build out on the first spot, <laughs> and uh, finally finally joined up again. I think right around two thousand one. Okay. Uh, 2001. And 
uh, was there until the, we moved, I don't know, 2006. Okay. Uh, over to the uh, Westbrook uh, Mill. Wonderful. Yeah. So following up on, uh, I don't know, Nat, maybe you can uh, speak to this. Like, was it, well, first off, was it diff? I mean, pull, to doing something like this must have been like a challenge. Did it all come together pretty easily? And then once it came together, did it, was it just like instantly like popular or did it take a while for it to kind of, <laughs> for it to kind of like, you know, get going? I think, well, it, we were really lucky that there was the main photo co-op as an antecedent to this, to the bakery project. And, you know, that was a real nonprofit organization that had a gallery space and classroom space and a big wet room and, and color dark rooms in the machine. It was a really a beautiful thing that was just too big. I think, I, I think the rent there was like close to two grand and there just weren't enough people using it and so when that couldn't maintain itself we were lucky that there was a group of folks that already knew each other that had an interest in continuing something more manageable and so that's how we found um that's why we found the 400 or 500 square foot space in the calderwood building so i wouldn't say it was like easy i mean there were some definitely some hard moments um trying to figure out how to work together as a as a kind of a collective, we didn't really have a, a a named structure for what we were, but we were we were pretty smart about our money. We were able to get some help from friends. Um, I remember Tanya had a friend who had maybe done well in tech or something, and just lent us five thousand dollars to help us. That was a big boon. There are a lot of people in this in this call who showed up, um, donated prints for us to sell at Photo Go Go, or or were buying things. And so it was, it was a really nice time in Portland art history, I think, that, that the community banded together so that this small group of people had a place to work. Awesome. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, like, I mean, it, it wouldn't have happened without people like Bill Gillis, who, you know, allowed us to get all that equipment and people like Betsy Evans, who, you know, just basically gave us her space for a couple of months to hold the fundraiser three years in a row. Um, and then support from a lot of other people, including people like Andy Graham and, um, you know, everybody that pitched in. There was an in-between period when the, when the, the co-op was in a basement space on Oak Street and we, we didn't have any place to put all the stuff. So we, so I don't know how this worked, but we got permission to load all of this stuff, including some giant metal sinks into the basement of the main college of art porches building. And so like <laughs> that was the storage um, for us to put all the darkroom equipment while we were building out. Um, well, the they, they actually tried to just get us to move in there several times. In fact, <laughs> they made a big pitch for us to move in there before we went to Westbrook because they, they basically wanted us to build their darkroom for them so that they could move in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because it's actually like really impressive, you know, I mean, for a bunch of friends, colleagues to come together and establish the space that is needed, you know, I don't, I, I just, I feel like that's a rare thing to actually pull off or to, for, for people to feel committed enough to establish something like this. I was going to add that it was really developed in a very short amount of time because by the time I remember I came in cold, I was I, we moved from New York City. I was printing and renting time at the local labs down there for my work, and um, you know when I discovered them, th there had to have been with the bakery. I mean, it, there had to have been, I want to say, fifteen members, maybe twenty, maybe as many as twenty. And uh, I remember having to write a you know formal letter. There was there was a lot of formality and organization to it. It was very robust, and and then the technical quality of the actual space, the the machine, uh, the color printing machine, the processor, it was superb. And, yeah. That, um, so sure. you know, props 
to that level of quality that had been achieved so quickly, both administratively and, you know, photographically. So speak more about the membership and I guess the selective process, you know, I mean, well, first off, speak about, I don't know, maybe Nat answered this question, but so you guys have established a space, you're using it, like, so did the membership just like skyrocket or was it kind of a slow moving thing as word got around? I mean, how did it, did y'all, when did y'all start getting a sense that like, you know, when y'all were like, holy shit, this is like a thing. Well, we got a lot of people right off because people were already using the the, the photo co-op. Um, but we we gained a lot of members early on really fast. I mean, we had probably 20 members after the first year. Wow. Um, and and uh, we maintained that for a long time. Um, and how much you know, were dues? In and out. I mean, people came in and out, in and out, in and out. So, you know, it was, you know, there weren't a lot of people that stuck around for many, many years. I mean, you know. And it was also a rental space because I remember going there not as a member, but as a renter um, to the original space. Right. Yeah. Well, can you. That was the hardest part to figure out, really, was that we had, there were no paid staff. And so it was, you know, created by a group that needed to use it and wanted to preserve time to be available to drop in and use it as needed and we were we knew that more people who were not members would benefit from access but we weren't prepared to staff it or help help people who didn't know what they were doing and we didn't want to give away all the darkroom time um, there were there was plenty of space for enlargers but not enough room to like navigate around bodies so um, if you had more than two or three people working it was pretty, pretty crowded. And so we were, I think that's the process Justin's referring to was not like, not so much of like, who are you or what kind of work do you do? It was more like, what's your intention here? Are you going to, do you want to be, are you saying you want to be a member and then you're going to, you're going to fly away after 30 days, or are you going to be a part of this group and share some of the labor of making it continue? And, and, and the members would commit time to be there uh, to assist the renters. It wasn't that the renters could come in whenever they wanted. There had to be a member there uh, to uh, you know, monitor the thing. And that's essentially, <laughs> I mean, that is still not very, very little has changed. Uh, that's exactly how we're doing it now, you know? That's always been the case, I think, mm -hmm. for 20 years. And and that's what, where sort of interns came in for years and years and years where we took people on that didn't have to pay um, dues so that, but they had to be there to, you know, receive renters, you know, a certain number of hours a week, which was a model that worked fairly well for a long time. Yeah. So what was the starting like monthly dues? I, th I have a feeling that hasn't changed at all in, in, in 20 years either. I thought, I thought it was a hundred dollars. It's, not, it's, it's not gone up. <laughs> well, we started with like 50 bucks and then quickly moved it up to a hundred and it sort of stayed there forever. Yeah. yeah. We, it's now 150. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, you know, it's a, it, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> A lot about the bakery stays the same. So tell us, tell, talk about the first couple of go-go's. Well, the, you know, like we said, the first one was really just like, we just were like, we need to have a fundraiser. Um, Cause we don't have enough money to finish, you know, basically doing what we needed to do and get the place going. And so, and Betsy offered us to use her space um, for what was really like a month, um, which was pretty generous of her. Um, and that was the first photo of go, go. Um, and that was, it was in the spring. Um, and the first year we did two and we did the second one where we always ended up being, which was the second Friday in December. Um, cause we didn't want to compete with first Friday. So we always did the second Friday. Um, the, f and <laughs> the second one, we actually did photo a no, no, um, which was all nudes, um, which, which, um, 
<laughs> which was kind of a fail. Although I, I have to say, Andy Graham probably bought half the show because he has a <laughs> personal collection of uh, nudes. That's like his thing. Um, so that was only okay. And then actually the third okay. year, we did a photo of GoGo, -Go, but we, we did a thing based on a model um, where uh, the, the Tanya was interested in. There's this gallery in Boston, the nonprofit gallery that did this thing where you would have a hundred artists and you would open the doors and everybody would run in and, and all the prints for a hundred dollars. And um, there was just one and it was like sort of first come first serve and people would, could come in and, you know, grab 10 if they wanted. And we did this thing. We expected it to be like this big hullabaloo, like it, it always is in Boston. And it was a total fail. Um, and then the year after that um, was when we started doing it in the hallways. And we ended up using like, you know, the entire downstairs of the Calderwood building, including like Brian Burwell's studio and that whole back hall and the whole front hall and stuff, which became like the model for it. And that's of course when Matt Robbins can speak up when we first got um, King Memphis to play. And we decided we wanted it to be much more about a big show uh, and a party essentially to celebrate photography and to celebrate what we were all doing, you know? So it was a fundraiser, but it was also to try and be like, you know, we want to get as many artists as we can and do like a free for all huge show, which of course ended up developing into what photo, you know, which in the mid 2000s when we had the ones in the in Westbrook that were kind of epic, taking up like, you know, 8,000 square feet and 175 artists and, you know, it was kind of insane. But yeah, the idea was to really push it as like a, you know, it was it was for many years, it was the biggest photo show in Maine every year um yeah which was pretty great and yeah. and you know, and that's that's really when it took off was like that fourth one where we sort of like made the model for what that was every year which was like creating a, a big event as much as anything okay well before we'll talk I want to move on to like the the transition to Westbrook but do, does anyone remember like a particularly massive go-go like where y'all were like holy crap yeah it has to be like one of those <laughs> ones in 2006 or 7 i can tell you the exact year but we moved you know from portland and the membership took off the communication took off and and it, you know we were really nervous with the community come with us and I think maybe the first year was a little bit modest, but by by year two in in Westbrook, because we had that amazing space, yeah, yeah. it was it was explosive. I mean, well, I, the, I'm, I'm guessing yeah. like eight hundred thousand people would show up. Um, it was shoulder to shoulder. There was tons of wine. Every all the members made food. Our, our kids donated. We started, you know, developing these aliases. It was really fun. Like you know, like you know, there were these like fictitious and every, everybody you know and it all sold or most of it anyway you know well, 2008 was probably the biggest one and that was that that ice storm if you remember yeah where, where the entire greater portland area lost power the morning of the photo of go go mm -hmm. and we panicked um and westbrook right. got power back like two hours before we were supposed to have the event and nobody else had power. Like Portland was still out of power, South Portland, everywhere else. And we just sent out a blitzkrieg of, that was like the advent of smartphones. And we blitzkrieged out of a, a, like a thousand texts and emails saying, we're open, Hello. we have power. Hello. And everybody mm -hmm. ended up showing up because nobody wanted to be home in the dark. And so we ended up getting yeah. probably more people than we would have. And we made it. Yeah, I would say that was the most special because party. people braved the ice. You know, they, they braved the ice and then you <laughs> took all their money. And we were shocked. You know, <laughs> that's fantastic. So talk about like when when was the dis I mean when obviously I've seen the bakery the Calderwood space and and clearly I mean it's that space right under the stair like by the stairwell right yeah it's it's really I mean, small yeah like super super small so talk about the move to Westbrook and and all of the challenges I mean I'm sure that was well again again a massive massive undertaking but well, that was that was a combination of, were... it was a combination of a couple of things one was we kind of out were outgrowing that space because we had 
a lot of members and uh, we we wanted to also start doing digital printing and we had no room in there for you know a computer or or digital printer or anything um, so and also the rent kept going up and up and up and up and up every year um, Katarina took care of us for a number of years but you know it eventually got to the point where we were like you know if we're going to pay this much rent we might as well be somewhere and and we just started looking for spaces and we ended up like looking at a whole ton of different ideas um and then we found that space at the dana warp mill and then i, I will have to say we we had a lot of help from the city of westbrook really had our backs on that that we we met the the guy who's the business director at the city of westbrook at the time i forget his name but he decided you know they wanted to sort of make westbrook like the new arts district of the greater portland area including the dana warp mill and so he basically got on our our side and and you know put the screws to the landlord to give us a you know a much better deal than we were getting and he actually cut the what was going to be the rent almost in half and gave us better terms in terms of the rent escalators and stuff um and then we got we got that loan um and it ended up moving so that was a really fascinating time in portland um, art community history that was around the time when the there was a building on congress street where um I guess it's where Emilitsa, the restaurant is across from space, had 40 or so artist studios in it. And they were, I mean, it was a really rundown building and it sold for about $500,000. And, you know, artists were losing studios left and right. And we went to the city of Portland and to the planning office and said, we are a group that wants to stay in town. Can you help us? And they just didn't know what to do with us. and didn't really know how to recognize any value in us. And it was so nice that the folks in Westbrook were like, we'll do everything in our power to welcome you over here. Um, and it was a really hard decision for us to figure out if, if it was gonna be too far away and were people still gonna come. And like, like um, they were saying before, like if we had a fundraiser, would anyone drive all the way to Westbrook to support? So it was kind of a, kind of a wild time um, and and really hard decisions. But I want to say one thing we didn't we didn't acknowledge David Wolf, who was our neighbor in the bakery mm -hmm. and has a shop there, was huge, huge, huge in the building of the space and the maintenance of the space. You know, he had he's a very hands-on mechanical kind of guy. He was always helping us fix stuff. When we had events, he would oh he machined hang. several parts for the hope. Yeah, many times <laughs> when I needed gears, I would go over and find him and he would he would find a gear that was exactly right for that hope machine. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about like the build the build out for I mean, Jack, you were very involved with that, right? At Westbrook. Yeah, it, it was uh, uh, pretty colossal. The the building, uh, I don't, I'm sure you've seen, uh, I, I think. I think it's Justin's photograph of what the room looked like. Yeah, I've seen it. it, we, it it's uh, uh, 4,000 square feet of just pillars. There was nothing in there. And essentially we built out uh, something that would be the size of a small two bedroom house inside that room. Uh, I can't remember how many, I, I want, Scott would probably remember. I, I think there were 150 sheets of sheetrock. I can't remember the at least there hundreds were, and were hundreds of dark rooms. steel steel because uh, the code required that the interior framing be metal studs. Yeah. You couldn't use wooden studs, and we had to get all that stuff up there. And one of the wonderful things that we lucked into was. We had an old uh, a freight elevator that came right up to our studios, and it was we were the only ones that ever used it. And this, I'm not making this up. As soon as the project was over and everything, the thing broke down. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> it was it was colossal, 
And you know, we, addition, we can talk about the fire too, if you want. Yeah, I was just going to say, in addition to that, <laughs> like the building, the She Rock was up. And I think we had overspent in the range. I'm just yep. throwing this number out about $10,000. And we were like, oh my God, what are we going to do yep. now? And within that same period of time, maybe within that few weeks, there was a fire in a print shop that was on the floor above us. And Matt it, was a furn- it was a furniture maker, and they had, no, it was a, they had a printer, wasn't it? It was a no. They, it was a furniture maker, and they had a they had a spray booth. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, and they had a some sort of spontaneous combustion go off in the spray booth, and started a fire. And the and fire trucks came in. All the all they the dumped hoses. A couple million dumped. gallons of water. There yeah. was a foot of water in our space. Water was in Mad Gabs downstairs. The walls, the new sheetrock walls, were filled up to about four feet with water. Yeah. And we were like, wow, everything we just did is ruined. Yeah. And the insurance company came in and, you know, I may be telling the story wrong, but, you know, we drilled holes in the bottom of the walls, the water mm-hmm. drained out, we put mm-hmm. in big fans and we got a, you know, and the insurance company came in and said, well, it's about $10,000 in damage. And they wrote yeah. us a check for $10,000 yeah. and yeah. we, and we drained and we dried everything out. And I don't think we spent a time of it. Just, it yeah. just brought us up to level. Yeah, we couldn't yeah, have no, finished. They, there was a it, they the insurance company got one of those mitigation companies came in and they they put in those dehumidifiers that were like the size yeah. of Volkswagens and For they two just weeks. dried it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, hmm. I don't think we could have finished the build out without the fire. <laughs> I know it's like a, <laughs> it's totally a blessing true. in disguise, right? <laughs> that fire and the ice storm were like the two like most harrowing moments I could ever recall. Yeah. Well, so the Westbrook space, that's the first time I ever experienced the bakery. I mean, that's the bakery I got to know. Um, And it was a really, really, really special, like walking in there, the light, the river outside of the window, um, you know, it was it was kind of y'all really created a a really amazing just environment. Um, So I guess. I mean, I was going to ask Liz, you, you got involved when, you know, during Westbrook, right? What did you, what were your immediate impressions of the bakery when you got there? Um, I wrote a little something about it. If you want to hear it, I was trying to like, kind of bring myself back in there. If you want to, can I, sure. anything that sure. I wrote? Okay. Um, so I, I, first of all, I uh, met Thatcher Cook and um, he lived in Westbrook and he wasn't a member, but he was there sometimes. And that's how I got to know the bakery in 2010 because he was, I was teaching photography at SMCC and he was, he came to speak at the school and then he started um, mm-hmm. giving me some um, feedback and some photography that I'd done in Serbia. And that's how I came across the bakery. And um, so I just wanted to, okay, just to kind of bring us there. The building was a bit of a maze. We were on the third or fourth floor, I don't remember, but it overlooked the Presumpscot River, which would be roaring in the springtime and was really beautiful. The members were from the Portland area mostly, but you could take the bus there pretty easily too. The space was like a hearth for all things film. And once you were there, it was a bit of a time travel. You had the very old musty mill building, the constant sounds of old pipes, huge swaths of sunlight from the old windows. Parking was impossible. So it was was a hike to get there and slightly creepy at night. The place was enormous, way bigger than we really needed. Still, there was stuff everywhere, decorative collections of old cameras, old curly film decorating the shelves like Christmas lights, two big iMac desktops, a scanner in the corner, an incredible library of photo books with an old comfy couch for naps. Hidden away through the door were several black and white dark rooms, color dark rooms, an acrid smell of fixer. Out in the common area, an enormous slop sink for developing film a drying closet, a wall for surveying darkroom prints, an old wooden table full of light tables, loops, compressed air. 
a dusty place where there was pa a paper cutter and tiny shards of paper on the floor. Tons of shelves filled to the hilt with old abandoned film, papers, donated cameras, prints, freshly printed work prints, contact sheets, old photo a go go posters line the wall. Always a huge party at the mill from with um, leftover booze from the bakery photo a go go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Reminder notes on the wall like shut this fan when you leave, a huge chalkboard with a schedule that was usually out of date, a tiny kitchen with a tiny fridge full of unclaimed leftovers through the <clears> kitchen, <throat> a New York City sized bathroom that had no mirror or ceiling and Polaroids hung above the sink. So that, wow, was, that, memory. that was vivid. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, <laughs> I was really impressed. I mean, I had lived in, you know, maybe four different towns by the time I came to Portland. And I always looked for community dark rooms. And um, it was kind of neat to be at the bakery because it was a time where there was, I mean, like it just, I was always impressed how strong film was in Maine, you know, and I got to take um, my boxes of negatives that I had shot and not fully Pro, like, you know, scanned and I was able to scan them there. And I was able to, um, I met with, um, was it Bob Monroe? Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned a lot from him about, you know, printing and gradations of between, you know, grays and blacks and whites. And um, yeah, and, and I was always welcomed with my students every year, which I really appreciated because I was, you know, teaching, um, a photography class that was entirely digital. And so I got to um, introduce the students to developing film and um, Jack was a big part of that. He did pinhole workshops in my class and then would meet up with the students. He was very generous with his time. And, um, and it was always good energy when Jack was there, you know? <laughs> fun guy. Um, but it was, it was a beautiful, community there was just a lot of it was the the work ethic was really inspiring I would say and um, I to this day really miss it just the the feedback that we'd give each other and just you know and also this sort of um you know there was there's was like a certain um um like ethic about how we print and how we develop and how we edit you know, film, maintaining the authenticity of the moment. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, great. I'm always learning. I always, when I'm doing my workflow, a lot of it came from the bakery. That's fantastic. So Natalie, <clears throat> I, you were like involved pretty much from the beginning until like 2007 and you were an intern. So I was hoping you could speak to like, how the space, like how, how that setup sort of worked, but also like what you were able to get out of it, like when you were a younger photographer, um, being in a kind of community like that, a facility like that, like being an intern. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think I started as an intern in 2008, actually, so I did oh. come in. Oh, wait, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm looking at Nat's, <laughs> it said Nat, I'm sorry. I'm giving you Nat's credentials. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I can't claim any of the, any of the making of that amazing space in Westbrook. So I came in probably when you had first seen the bakery and what Liz was describing, like, and the same, have, that was so vivid, Liz, like I could, I was there again in that space and it was so awesome. Um, the only thing I would add to, to that, um, like nostalgia remembering of that Westbrook space is that as an intern, you'd had, you know, certain nights that you'd have to be there and, you know, people would be there certainly for go-go. And I remember that, um, ice storm go-go too, but some nights it was, there was no one there, but you mm. it's in Westbrook or it's the winter or whatever. And that space, um, was 
scary at night when you're by yourself in this old mill with the creaky floors and the sounds. And I just remember like Liz Atterbury in particular, she and I would be interns maybe on the same night or we would talk about it later and we would use the color dark room if nobody's coming in, we might as well print. And the color dark room was especially like harrowing because it's of course pitch black. And the way it was designed, you'd be in this like tiny room and you'd use the enlarger and then you put your, you know, print in your safe your, and then you walk out into this darkness of this like long hallway in this mill building in Westbrook in winter at night, like by yourself and then try to find the color processor and <laughs> <laughs> we would joke about how it would be so funny if there was like a night vision camera installed to, sh to because the people coming out of the color dark rooms, you do this thing where you're like, like, you know, like <laughs> kind of weirdly like afraid of ghosts or something, but also hitting the refrigerator or whatever. Like there was just all this amazing, like, you know, movement happening as you tried to get yourself to the enlarger and, you know, get your print inside or not the enlarger, but the processor. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was just, it was such a, such a great place. And I really would love to go back there someday, but I'm really curious about the new space. I haven't been inside yet, well, but we'll in terms of being an intern, I mean, just briefly, like we had, you know, just different duties, like working on the website or helping a renter or helping with a workshop, like Kelly Anderson Stolly's workshops or one of those, um, and trying to keep things organized. But as Scott was saying, like it's a volunteer sort of system, so it is hard to organize a group of volunteers to stay, you know, the continuity of it. So, yeah. So obviously between, you know, 1999, 2000 and 2022, photography has gone through profound, significant, you know, monumental changes. And I'm wondering if anyone has anything to share about a moment when you realized that the purpose of this facility, which is to give photographers, you know, the means to make their pictures and prints, whatever, um, has suddenly like under undergone a major, you know, now that, I mean, was there a point when anyone sensed, oh, wow, things are really changing? Well, well, I could speak to that. I guess that's about the time that I was there. Um, um, I think I, I maybe I joined more like in 2010 or I, I had started using the place in Westbrook as a renter earlier than um, than when I became a member. And um, I how many it had like eight or nine dark rooms in it, um, maybe three black, three black and white. And then one that was there was six. How many? There were six, three six. and three, three wet, three dry. Three wet, three dry. Okay, then there was that one that was like on the black and black and white side, but it was not not a dark room at that point. It was more storage. Oh right, yeah. Um, so I was there was close a to the alternative of, process room. Yeah, it was a bunch <laughs> of dark rooms and and um, beautiful big space. But at, at some point, we realized um, that 80, 90 percent of the and then we had this digital printer in, in the Westbrook space and a nice big wall for putting your prints up. And um, at some point we realized like, I was using the dark rooms um, and the digital printer. I was using a black and white dark room. I was printing every week. I would come in and print for, um, for uh, the Todd Webb estate, Betsy Evans's um, thing. And um, so it was great to have it as a resource. And, Eventually, I just said, I'm going to become a member. And um, some of the members ha had um, started, we started losing some members and, and people weren't coming to rent the dark rooms as much. And we realized that, you know, 80, 90% of the people that were coming in were renting the digital printer. And there was a bottleneck at the digital printer. Um, and towards the end of the lease, the lease in Westbrook um, 
was going up every year. Um, part of, I, I, I don't remember how much it was, but it was more than a normal lease. I think it had been um, negotiated that we'll get low payments up front and they'll be pretty high at the end. And they, they were like almost 2,500 at the end. And we'd lost a bunch of members. So um, things were really tight, uh, close to the bone. Um, and we realized, I mean, we, we somehow eked it out, you know, and made it through that lease. And as soon as we had the lease paid off, we had a meeting and, and of, of, um, I think Smith had come on recently. We got a few new members. Jocelyn had just rejoined Jocelyn Lee and, um, we decided what are we going to do? Um, and, and I remember Liz was there. Um, Liz so, was there. Justin came back. Yeah, and and it was it was like, are we going to have a future? And um, um, about this time, Jocelyn had purchased a building in in Portland, and and um, right during this process, and said, why don't you come, you know, be in this building? And um, so we went from the four thousand square feet because you guys, you know, needed so many dark rooms and so much space, it wasn't needed anymore. And we went to, um, I think it's around 1500 square feet. Yeah. And, and we built that out. Justin single-handedly built that out. Built those dark rooms. Built the dark rooms. And, well, and I, so I, we, gave I just... space, we gave more space to the digital printing and that, at that time and, and then still kind of retained two dark rooms um, for, the for the purists. Well, I specifically remember there was a meeting where, and I think Justin was there. Um, I think Scott came, um, but it was, it was like literally on the table. It was like, okay, do we just let this thing go, you know? Do we, you know, and I think there was kind of, and I mean, there was sort of this reluctance in the room to be like, nobody really kind of wanted to just like let it go. And um, I think that Tony Harbert deserves mad, crazy, crazy, crazy uh, mm -hmm. thanks and props and oh, you. Um, Tony pretty much, if anyone had seen the Westbrook space, in the last, like the, the, the shape it was in, there was a lot of stuff in that space. And Tony almost, I feel like Tony almost like cleaned out that whole thing almost on his own. But but. As, as I was listening to Liz's wonderful description, which just, you know, showed us all vignettes of that place that many of us had forgotten. It was just beautiful and it covered so much. You think about all that material and all of the entire facility, Tony single-handedly moved. Pretty much. Crammed it into this 1500 square foot space in Jocelyn's building. Yeah. And, well, that, I mean, incredible. I, okay. I, um, I think the, the bakery exists because certain people step up, um, you know, like, um, like, you know, you did when I left Smith, but like Scott, um, Justin, that Jack, like where you put way too much work into something then is reasonable um, and let it kind of take over your life for a while. And, um, and, and of course, you, at some point you get burnt out, but, but I think the bakery wouldn't exist without, without, you know, Maniacal, manic minds. Certainly. Yeah. No, it's true. I know when we built out the Westbrook space, that took a long time. It took months. And I know I was there like 60 hours a week for three or four months, like yeah. working nonstop. But during that time, there was that um, Justin, what was his name? Alex um, oh, Jacobson. Jacobson, yeah. who was like, he was kind of an intern for a while. And he came and he just got really excited and helped us. He was there for hundreds and hundreds of hours um, helping me build so much of that space. 
and then he just kind of left after it was done like he he was like interested in the collective for a while but then he kind of wandered off and he moved back to boston and it was like and it's it's been like that all along the way there's people that have sort of given a lot of effort with with you know the idea that it's it's worth something and it's important and you know people need this but you know without expecting but it's like this it, it's um, great it's, it's like this amoeba it's like you know you can't you can't get too comfortable with it you know yeah and it, yeah, that's you know it's it's these it's these people that just come in their lives are available and they've got energy you know you 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 gave me way too much credit when you said i built out the portland space alone i, I couldn't have done it alone i mean tony helped me a great deal david leith helped an immense amount and um, Nick Jervin and I were just talking, who's in this meeting somewhere, I think I saw his name. Um, you know, he, it was when he started getting introduced to the bakery and sort of like getting, developing his interest. We would get these massive loads of lumber from Hancock Lumber, you know, this giant truck would show up, but you know, put it all in the parking lot. And he just showed up, he says, yeah, I've got nothing to do today. I'll help you move it in. And that's a tremendous amount of work. And it showed, you know, this, it's, it's an enormous gift. Yeah. Well, okay, so we'll move on to back to Portland. I do want to say one thing about packing up Westbrook. Um, it was, <clears throat> I mean, I, it, it was bittersweet in a lot of ways. In some ways, it was just bitter. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it was because you really got this. I'm not just being a joke, ju just making a joke, but like, um, because we threw away so much stuff, like old technology, that was only a matter of like 10, 15 years, but it was like huge rolls of like Kodak five by seven, you know, to make, like to crank out like, you know, machine prints or something, like all of this photo stuff that was now kind of obsolete. And there was this just undeniable sense of, change and everything and part of the reason of moving like one of the things that we kind of made a commitment to when we went to portland was that it really was no longer about just the facility you know we were back i mean woodford's corner was a great place to be the possibility that we could suddenly have just like walk-ins you know people were living suddenly like real close by and just kind of coming by so kind of focusing again on that sense of community um and especially you know because digital had been around long enough now that people had said you know at first it was great that it was like oh i can do all of this at home and on my own but then you know you do you work on your own at, at home alone for a while you start to you start to want you know the presence of other human beings again so that's kind of what we focused on so i would like to um sort of give a shout out to some of the current members who are here. I see Richard Wexler's here. He's a very new member. Um, there's Nick, Ger Nick Gervin, Gervin, sorry. Uh, he's here. When did, when, when were you, when did you join on Nick? Like 2018 or 2017? Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, right from the get-go in the Portland location. So like uh, Justin said, I, I lived down the street and, you know, I heard you guys were moving in the neighborhood. So I would, I was often uh, out shooting the streets and I would walk by on my way home and, and see all the equipment, this giant pile of photography stuff. <laughs> it was a giant pile. And I was like, what is this place opening? What can I do to help them? And so I just kept poking my head in until Justin uh, said, yeah, come carry some sheetrock. <laughs> and uh went from there and um i was an associate at first and then uh soon after the three months i joined up as a member and and it's, i think i'm going on four years now so awesome i see nancy's here and 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 maya who is our studio manager she's here um, i'm here I'm hello here. hi hi guys nice to see you all um so we got about, you know, it's almost eight o'clock. Um, we can keep going a little bit longer, but um, this is kind of something for everybody. Um, what, <clears throat> you know, obviously the bakery is, was, will always be a tremendous amount of work and we get a lot out of it, but it's also very frustrating. Just, you know, volunteer setup, 
um, you know, can get on anyone's nerves. But um, it was so funny. I mean, with the amount of work that would go into your average photo a go go when it was in person, um, you know, it's a very stressful thing. But I, you know, each time that we had one, I would always have about a little five minute moment in the middle of it all where I was able to kind of look around and see what this thing was and see everybody kind of enjoying themselves and King Memphis going and people actually looking at work and people there who never really shown anywhere before and were thrilled to have something on the wall. And I, I remember somebody saying to me, Talasa Raj, Raj said to me one, one year, she was like, there's nothing like this. She's <laughs> like, their photo openings are not like this. You don't go to a photo opening and have a couple of hundred people there, you know? And I always, you know, photo a go-go was never like, okay, now it's going, now we can all relax because there was always the end, the packing of the prints and everything, which was like just as stressful, if not more than everything else. But I did always have that little five minute window where I was like, this is so cool. And I don't know, I feel like it wasn't just something I had with photo a go-go, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm just wondering if people can talk about like moments that they had in the space with people or whatever that where you were just kind of like, this is a pretty cool thing to be a part of. Uh, I would love to interject if that's cool. Sure. Um, so my name is Christian Cutler. I'm, I'm a uh, master's degree in photo and I live here in Missouri. I'm the gallery director at the University of Central Missouri. Um, so for over 10 years, my wife and I have been wanting to relocate to Maine and Portland. Um, and in 2011, I, I flew up to Portland and happened upon a, a poster for Photo A Go Go. And, um, and had no clue about what was going on at the bakery. Um, uh, we're, we're big supporters now, but nonetheless, um, I attended your 2011 fundraiser. And um, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, for about five and a half years, I worked for Jackson Fine Art Photography Gallery in Atlanta. And we used to sell, I see Scott Peterman is in attendance. Uh, we would sell Scott's work. Um, uh, I knew about Tanya Hollander already and her Facebook photography project. So I wandered in to the sale and was just thrilled to see names that um, I recognized. Um, I ended up outbidding the, um, the director of the Portland Museum um, for one of Scott's, uh, Scott's photographs. And at that same photo of Gogo, I, um, I had actually a day before accepted a job um, as director of the galleries here at the University of Central Missouri. Um, I was flying in to Portland from Atlanta um, but um, nonetheless, I, I ran into Tanya and asked her if she would like to be one of my first exhibits uh, in Missouri for the Facebook photography project. Um, I just, I think what you guys are doing is exceptional. And I, I would like to be proof in the pudding uh, because um, <laughs> I continue to follow and, and support you guys. And um, um, I think your group is exceptional. And um, so, so kudos and, and thank you for, for everything you're doing. And, and this, um, this, this Zoom alone is, is awesome, so. <laughs> thank you, Christian, that was great. That's great to hear. I, uh, can I add one last sort of snarky memory? But, uh, snark, <laughs> is, snark is very welcome. Yes, please, Jack. <laughs> this has all been uh, I, too sweet. We need I to remember need to there was it up. there were discussions like in 20 2008 or something. We got to stop taking cash. We've got to start taking credit cards. And uh a year or two after that and it might have been in 2011, I remember there was an issue of the the drinks weren't free anymore and we had to get a, a licensed 
a beer distributor or something. And then that year sales were way down, but then they went way, way up the next year. And uh, Tony came up with the, with the new credit card machine hooked to your iPhone that improved sales. And I know the sales were good that year. I don't, I think uh, um, Amy would probably know the number or Scott probably would, but I, I think we sold $35,000 with that night. But I do remember there was uh, 45 gallons of beer disappeared and 102 bottles of wine. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it was good times. I didn't make any of those numbers up. <laughs> I will say in general, I am, I am so thankful for the collective, um, you know, and what it was for me as, as a development of an artist, you know, I, I, you know, those, those early years when we were in that small space, um in the in the bakery building um i made so much work and it was so great to be around photographers every day in there you know i mean that's the kind of thing you can only get being in school you know really just you know having people to bounce ideas off of to critique your work to you know learn technical stuff from and i got i it was so critical for me to be able to get stuff done. I mean, I, in that little space with that horrible old hope machine, I ended up, you know, printing and mounting four solo shows in New York and two in LA and Atlanta and, and Portland. I mean, I, you know, that was, that was like the development of my career as an artist um, that would have been impossible without it um, to, to be able to have that kind of energy and the facilities to do that. It's, it's kind of remarkable. And I'm sure, you know, many other people have the same experience over the years, you know, having access to that space. Does anyone else want to share about work they, cr they created while there or projects or um, the way the space influenced their practice, their craft, career, et cetera? I, I, I think, um, yeah. To add on to Scott, yeah, I think it's helped so many people. I mean, myself definitely have I've printed shows, but I, I mean, I remember people, um, more than one person came from Boston just to print their show there because they couldn't do it in Boston or couldn't do it affordably in Boston. Um, and I and in New York too, I remember people coming up um, would stay, you know, like a week and just print their shows. Um, then we started doing the artist residencies too. Um, it, it, yeah, it's just, I'm grateful to the place and so many of you, you know, that were there before me, um, you know, we all <laughs> stand on each other's shoulders for it, but. Um, and sometimes we get crushed. <laughs> it's it's important to also point out, I mean, you were talking about the community. I mean, there was, there were artists with, you know, a capital A, and there are artists with a little A there in there too. And, and the bakery community has been welcoming to everyone. Um, and, you know, you might turn to your right or to your left one day, you know, it's like, wow, you know, I'll just see what Scott thinks, you know, and or I'll see what Tanya thinks or, you know, or Tony. And that's amazing, you know, and, you know, but it, it, it's, and then they're just like, you know, there's some people just, there were interlopers as well that um, maybe they weren't as, developed, uh, you know, maybe they didn't have shows or anything like that, but it didn't matter, you know, it, it, the bakery was very welcoming and uplifting to everyone. Um, and I always thought that, because you, you never know when that perfect comment is going to, who it's going to come from, you know? Uh, so I just always appreciated that openness. And I, I think in some way that what, that's, you know, the, um, the role of Photo and Go -Go is that um, everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame that evening. And, um, and, and then not only that, but there, cause I mean, I, I had students who would show their work and, you know, just, um, you know, if I hadn't, didn't have 
something going on with a show. It was like a good focus for myself. Um, and then also everybody just sort of, it's the, the group effort and getting Photo A Go Go ready was, you know, it was, we could put our own egos, our own work aside, and then, you know, like work as a collective for this one thing. And, and people would come out of the woodwork and, um, and help out, even people who didn't do it for that year, there was a sense of like purpose and excitement. And, you know, I mean, this, like Scott spoke about the celebration. Yeah, Nancy, did you have something to say? Or wait, did I just talk over someone? Oh, I was just going to throw it. It's just sort of an, an example of the every the every person involved thing. I mean, it's GoGo, -Go, of course, and lots of people are donating from GoGo. -Go, but you know, I remember um, Scott's children, Ruby and Bianca, uh, Bianca donated. You know, and I went to my kids and I said, you know, Ruby and Bri Bianca, they they they've donated. What are you going to do this year? And they're like, I don't know. And I there's probably some memory back there. You know, my son Oliver went, I said, well, go ask Scott what he thinks. He had two pictures to choose between and how to crop it or whatever. And he got that connection, you know, and they remember it to this day. Yeah. Nancy? Oh, well, I have a lot to say, but I won't say it all. <laughs> I, um, I became a renter at the bakery when it was in its first spot in the bakery building. I had little kids and I couldn't trip over my own feet without every day. Um, so I was just a renter and then dropped out during, but always donated to GoGo. -Go. And then in 2017 or 18, I was having a show. You guys had just moved back to Portland and I reached out to Tony because I needed to make some big prints and you hadn't quite opened yet for renters and Tony, you were so great to help me and work with me and made these big three by six foot black and white photographs for a show that I was having. And then I am still here. And you got sucked in. I got sucked in, yeah. And happily so. And it's great, you know, it's 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 got its own pulse to it, you know. People come, people go, it expands, it retracts, but it still keeps going. It's kind of like a snake, you know, that it is it's like <laughs> it's like a snake or a roach. <laughs> I think there's gotta be a better analogy, but um yeah so i would do want to say something about gogo -Go. uh gogo -Go, you know obviously since we moved to back to portland the space was much much smaller we had to unfortunately start being a little selective about the pictures and the last two gogos have been online and they've been very sort of called well not called pulled together very you know under in in strange and difficult times and we did very well last uh in 2020 um but it's like we didn't know if it what was going to be the situation with this past one in 2021 and you know it's not like we want to get the online thing we want to drill that down and have that be a routine it's all just kind of a placeholder until it can be in person again so i just want to tell everybody that like we're going to be in person again and hopefully back in a, you know, a bigger space where everybody can bring in a print once more and it can be kind of like the old days. So, um, yeah, no, it's a special thing. Well, we got that great review just this week. Yeah, we have a show at uh, Speedwell Projects right now. Um, and uh, we got a wonderful write up in the Press Herald. Um, and things are things the the membership has doubled. We have 14 members right now. Um, and we're doing really, really well. So Nick, do you want to say some quick words about what to expect this year? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we're going to have an exciting year. We're, we're working on a lot of things as far as getting some educational programming going and um, just kind of trying to fine tune things and 
bringing it back to the, you know, the punk rocker, do it yourself kind of attitude of the bakery and, and just trying to, you know, keep things moving along in a positive way. Um, I hope more people just come in and hang out. We have a really big library, of, you know, 500 books now. Um, just grab a coffee and come hang out, even if you're not printing or, or whatnot. And um, we'd love to see you just stop by or, you know, come by and print with us sometime. Dark rooms are there. Uh, alternative processing, film development, um, you know, everything's there. We got two large uh, digital printers and and uh, everybody there is, it's just like you kind of explained in the past, everybody there is, has a deep passion for photography, but also a connection to community. And I think that's where we're, we're trying to think about in the future is, is building that stronger community, so. Yeah, totally. You so know, this has been incredible, unless somebody else has something to say. Yes, I just want to throw in one thing, Smith, if I could, and it just hasn't been mentioned. It's probably obvious to everyone, but it might not be to some, that we're a 501c3 now, and we haven't always been. And that means, you know, obviously that our funding can be different, and it's, and it's got different implications for people who donate. Um, so we're on a completely different kind of financial footing than we've been in the past. We always dreamed of doing it, and for the, I think it's been six years now. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, I think we got it in like 2017. Yeah, we got a donate button on the website. Wink, wink. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you need that write off this year, you know, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. Um, it is pretty amazing how this thing just keeps sort of chugging along. Um, to follow up on what somebody said, uh, you know, it, it is funny sometimes, you know, we have those on that big night of go-go, suddenly like people start showing up and there's lots of hugs and all that stuff. So um, it's congratulations, Scott and everybody for, and Nat and just, every, I call, you know, Jack, a collective, I'm sorry I'm, if I'm missing individual names, but just a collect for, for getting this crazy thing going and keeping it going. Long live VPIC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there you have it. Wow, that was fun. It's wonderful to see everybody. I'm disappointed Jack's uh, signature Hawaiian shirt is missing, however. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Quick change. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Smith. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks. much. You asked a lot of great questions. It was really well done. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Thank you for the writing. I would also yeah. like to provocative uh, prose. I'd also like to just thank everybody that that made this place possible over all the years. And um, for someone like me, who I, I don't have an education in, in photography or anything like that, I didn't go to college. So this is this place means a lot to me. And uh, thank you for keeping it alive, and doing what you do. Totally. I mean, I pretty much all of my friends, my main friends, and ev pretty much every creative thing I've been involved with in the last six, seven years has been because of the bakery. It all, it all becomes, it, it all is about the bakery. I mean, every, I mean, obviously everybody in this grid, I know through the bakery, but you know, outside of the bakery, I have no friends. <laughs> anyway, y'all can laugh. Oh, everybody's muted. Okay. I was like, you can laugh. It's not true. Yes, it is. <laughs> We're a dysfunctional family. It's okay. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. All right. Good night, Thank guys. You. Good night. Thank I you. hope we do this again. You all. Bye, bye. Bye. All right. I'll see you in another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs>